Chelsea. Hello and welcome back to Chelsea. It has been an incredible week celebrating the best the horticultural world has to offer. I always feel with Chelsea that it is this unique combination of, you know, gardening advice and you take notes and all that sort of stuff, but it's a show. Yeah. It's a performance. Yeah. It's, it's the like catwalk going to the of garden design yeah. as well. Yeah. It's yeah. like going to the theatre. It's fun. Yeah, and I think that element <laughs> is really important. Yeah. It's, you know, gardening can just revel in itself and just, I love that sense that everything comes together. Da -da, yeah. you know? And at this time of year as yeah. well, you know, yeah. it's such a beautiful time of year. Well, we've got plenty coming up this evening to inspire you as we head into the weekend. Adam has his final design guide of the week explaining how you can create a beautiful space at home that not only benefits wildlife, but is also a sanctuary for you to enjoy. Carol's back with her guilty pleasure planting guide, telling us about the classic flowers that can breathe new life into your garden. And I will be chatting with the actress and self-proclaimed passionate gardener, Caroline Quinton, about her love of Chelsea after she invites us to her own garden in Devon. First, just a few moments ago, Sophie and I revealed who you crowned the winner of this year's BBC RHS People's Choice Award. Let's take a look. Well done. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank well you very done. much. Ooh, in the air. Thank Yay. you very much. <laughs> well, Monty, you can see why this won the People's Choice Award, because it's, it's a garden, and it's yeah. accessible, and it's relatable to, and it's beautiful. It's very beautiful, and, and immediately, Simon, so, mean, we're standing here with these lovely grass falling and spilling, combined with the fluffy peony. Now, they're not an automatic combination, but it works. Yeah. It's pleasing. Chris has got form on this. He knows <laughs> what he's doing. Of course you know, he knows he what he's doing. He knows how to create th th that sort of softness and relatability. It's calming, it's tranquil. There's lots of vistas, views yeah, I mean, through it. So your eyes being drawn. Yeah. From here, we've got three vistas. And I know that the, you know, the public can't get onto the garden. But from outside, there are vistas through the planting, drawing the eye into key areas as well. But this garden is also a journey. And, and yeah. we pause there, and then we're led on. Yeah. And a simple journey, and the planting, you, you feel completely immersed in the planting all the way through this garden. And I think you know, the myeloma story is of hope. OK, it's a very serious thing. But this idea of appreciating the moment, of appreciating beauty, yeah. of just, life can be very tough, but there is exquisite beauty, and we've got it here. There is, and even things like yeah. the details of this water feature, the sound is really important, and I, I love this view. This is my favourite view, yeah. back through the garden, when it's backlit, the ferns and the iris, yeah. and it, it's very, you know, there's a generosity about yeah. this garden yeah. that I love, and I think that that's what everyone related to. Yeah, no, I, I, I can absolutely get that. Well, this was the people's favourite. But there are many areas of Chelsea that the public don't get to see, and Rachel and Eric took a tour of the showground to reveal the hidden Chelsea. So we're coming to the end of the week. And I feel like we have seen so much of the show this year. Yeah, but even when you think you've seen it all, there are still so many hidden gems out there. Mm. This is true. You see. <laughs> Alright, have you seen this? No, okay. On the roof of the RSPCA garden, Ooh. and there's this lovely, well, it's a green roof, but not sedums and the things you, you'd normally expect. I just love that there's so many flowers. The thrift, the little erigeron, there are times around the edge. It's really unexpected, actually, which is lovely. 
but I can see that they've planted into waste material, mm -hmm. which is good. And also, if it rains, you'll get these little ephemeral pools, which is perfect for mm. wildlife. It's so lovely. Ephemeral pools. Ephemeral pools, ephemeral madam. Pools. I'm teaching you things, you know. <laughs> Keep up. <laughs> Rachel, come and have a look in here. You <laughs> I'm have intrigued. To, you have to see this. Right. Have you ever seen anything like this? No. I haven't been in here all show. I've been here all week and not been in here. It's extraordinary. It's incredible. This containerized mushroom heaven is going to be relocated to its final destination, which is a community garden, so that people can grow their own mushrooms. Amazing. I love it. So I thought you so had to cool. see this. Thank you. When you're here at the show, there are just so many things to see. You get a bit dazzled, and then I think you tend to miss things. And I just was stopped in my tracks before and looked at this combination. Very simple, the trolley is so pretty. That geranium mayflower, and it's so beautiful. You know, you are so right, and the colour combination. Look at that stem. Yeah. Oh, beautiful, isn't it? I thought you'd like that. I definitely <laughs> like that. I love it, actually. Thank you for that. Now, Rachel, at Chelsea, there's the familiar, yeah? There's the roses and the ferns, yeah. but take a look at those over there, Arasimas. How unusual are they? There's always the weird and the wonderful at Chelsea, I they think. They are amazing. You know what they actually remind me of? It might sound weird. They look like meerkats. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think? <laughs> they do. I shall never look at them the same again. <laughs> oh, great. Amazing. Brilliant. <laughs> every day, these lovely Chelsea pensions that have been having lunch every day on this garden. How's it going? We are having lunch. Fantastic. Yeah. What an experience. Brilliant. And you've just got a short stroll home. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I should think, I should think so, with all these glasses. <laughs> well, we can see this is part of Central here, so definitely. maybe we'd better leave. <laughs> we'll leave you to it, James. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the nurseries exhibiting here at Chelsea work really hard to produce new plant varieties for, for us all to marvel at, with many potentially becoming firm favourites in our borders and homes over the coming years. The RHS introduced the Plant of the Year Award back in 2010. Last year's winner was Symponium Destiny here at Surreal Succulents, it's looking absolutely stunning. And Nick Bailey has this year's results. There's a huge range of new plants on display this year at Chelsea. And in order to be entered into the RHS plant of the year, they have to go through a pretty rigorous judging process. Now they're assessed for innovation, impact and appeal. Now, before I reveal the RHS Plant of the Year, let's have a look at some of the runners-up. Coming in at third place is this plant. It's Wigila Camouflage. Now, it's a really useful, compact shrub. It's got these classic kind of burgundy ruby red flowers, which are produced between May and June time. And the thing that makes it quite distinct and different is it's got this darker, interesting variegation around the edge of the leaves, which really sets it apart from other Wigilas. Coming in at second place is this extraordinary hydrangea euphoria pink. That's a really special plant that's all about colour. It starts the year with tritone foliage in green, pink and white, and then come into midsummer and it produces these beautiful multi-tonal flowers and what's really useful is it's a super compact plant not much more than about a meter and perfect in dappled shade and the rhs plant of the year is this it's agapanthus black jack and it's the most extraordinary looking plant really dense heads and that incredible violet tone of course, agapanthers have hugely increased in popularity over the last 30 years. The vast majority tend to be in mid or pale blue tones, but 
the violet notes to this. There's really strong globose heads and the fact that there's masses of buds still to come at the top. I mean, I think it's an absolutely justifiable winner, the RHS Plant of the Year. Chris, I have to say this is a truly spectacular agapanthus. Beautiful colour, but it's got a special quality as well, right? That's right, Nick. Yes, it actually repeat flowers for three months. Lovely, strong stems also, and so a particularly superb plant. Fantastic. And now if people wanted to grow this at home, what are the ideal kind of conditions you're looking for? Well, bred in South Africa, it needs some sunshine, so six to eight hours of bright sun a day. Soil's not really fussy, well-drained is good, uh, but one of its other redeeming features is a very strong, stout flowering stem, so it will put up with a good level of wind. Fantastic. Well, I don't think it could be a more deserved winner. It's gorgeous. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Congratulations to you all. Now, a Chelsea first. A collaboration of eight nurseries called the Plant Fair Roadshow. And they're working together to make their mark here at Chelsea by highlighting the importance of micro and small nurseries. We caught up with them during their preparations for the show. I must have three or four hundred different plants growing on the nursery this year and lots more in stock in the garden. I specialise in hardy herbaceous perennials. If people ask me what my favourite plant is, I often change my mind. At the moment I'm really enjoying the euphorbias and then later on in the season I'll really enjoy some of the grasses. My name's Paul Seaborn. Welcome to my lovely nursery here in Sussex at Pelham Plants. We moved here about 15 years ago. It's a lovely woodland edge site, a very relaxing place, a beautiful countryside location. So I've worked in horticulture now for about 20 years. I worked for other nurseries and some really inspiring horticulturalists who gave me the love of propagating and growing plants for myself. The idea of setting up my own nursery was beyond my dreams, but starting a garden here and then slowly developing a nursery over the last 15 years has been really exciting. We're a very small nursery. We pretty much propagate almost everything that we sell here. I suppose on that micro scale, we have to be careful how we manage our time. I know going to plant fairs is one of the best ways to access a huge range of plants and get lots of advice. Plant Fairs Roadshow uh, is a collaboration of small independent nurseries. We've got well over uh, 40 nurseries involved. We meet up for regular plant fairs across the southeast. It's been shown to be a lifesaver for many of those small micro nurseries that really can't get an audience that you can get at a plant fair. So I was very excited when I met Colin and his colleagues at the Plant Fairs Roadshow to be invited along. And ever since, uh, that's been one of the mainstays of my business. It's actually really useful to meet up with my colleagues now and again. It's more of a community in what could otherwise be quite an isolating situation. The RHS invited the Plant Fairs Roadshow to Chelsea Flower Show to have a corner of the pavilion to ourselves. There'll be eight of us nurseries, so what we've got there are a number of nurseries now that have never done anything like this before. And I think this could be really exciting for the RHS and maybe in the future they'll invite more small nurseries. So these are some of the plants we're growing for Chelsea. I've got them in the shady tunnel to try and cool them down and I don't want them to peak too soon. This is uh, geranium phaeum. I'm a little concerned that these are flowering too early. This is a uh, beautiful thalictrum. This is thalictrum black stockings, so named for its really dark stems. Sadly, these large plants that I was hoping to take to Chelsea, I think the buds are opening too soon and I think the flowers will be too far ahead. But luckily, I'm hoping that a backup plan of some younger plants, which are further behind. So fingers crossed, we'll have a good selection for the day. Okay, that's great. All set, off to the roadshow. We're here at Arundel Castle. There's 15 really keen nurseries who are looking to display seasonal plants that will be good for people's gardens. Hopefully there's going to be hordes of people steaming in to buy all our lovely plants. I'm uh, Colin Moat. I'm uh, the event coordinator for Plant Fairs Roadshow. Survive the journey. Given the cold spring, how's it going? What are the plants looking like? Trying to get things ready for 
a particular few days in May, that's been probably the most difficult thing this year. The exhibitors we've got here today who are doing Chelsea are Swallowfield, who's a new exhibitor, Rachel Castle, Miles Japanese Maples, Paul of Pelham, all three of those that have never done Chelsea before. We've got Graham at Plant Base, who has done Chelsea quite a few times. We then have No Name Nursery, Steve Edney and, and Lou Dow, and the cheeky little nursery called Pineview Plants, which is myself. Last but by no means least, we've got gold medal winning Daisy Roots, Annie Godfrey, who is still not forgiving me for making her in charge of the Chelsea plot. So as one of the more experienced exhibitors at Chelsea amongst the Plant Fair Roadshow group, um, I'm kind of the person at the end of the phone or the email if anyone's got a question and hopefully answering so that everyone feels more comfortable about and less petrified of doing the huge thing that is Chelsea Flower Show, yeah. This will be our first time exhibiting at Chelsea and we're very excited about it. I feel that as a whole we are much more than our individual parts. When we come together we make something wonderful and I think the public are going to enjoy the story of our nurseries. We're all really excited to be exhibiting at Chelsea. Who wouldn't be? There is a lot of trepidation, but actually working together as a team, even though it's individual displays, it's just really exciting and uh, we're loving it. Chelsea's not very far away now, and this is the first time we've ever taken part in, our, in the RHS Speciality Corner. So to bring all of these eight nurseries together, we're all getting very excited. We've shared a few ideas today, and hopefully, who knows, we may get some good results in the end. And here we are in the Plant Fairs Roadshow in the Great Pavilion. And I'm here with Garden as well, Sue Kent. So it's a great idea, this, isn't it? Sort of putting these micro nurseries together, they're greater than the sum of the parts in a way. I think it's brilliant. You've got eight little displays all around a central hub and it allows all small nurseries to come and show what they're doing. And they've also, at the show, got a central part, the little hub, where anybody can go and ask questions on how to grow things. So it's a bit like a plant doctor yeah, centre. Yeah, lovely. And I mean, also the diversity, because we're always looking for unusual plants, stuff you might not be able to find in the bigger nurseries. So have you seen anything you're particularly interested in? Well, I have. I'm a bit, a bit nerdy. So I have gone for Miles Japanese Maples, which shows the development from seed to tree, I've got a little education on, on how their maples grow, and they've got loads of little mini maples Lovely. in a container. And they're fabulous, and it's really attracted me. That sounds very educational. It does. Should you have a little poodle around? We will indeed. So, Paul, your first Chelsea ever. How's it been? Oh, it's been great. I'm completely out of my comfort zone, but I've I loved it. Putting this together has been amazing. But it's not just you, is it? Because it's a team effort here. Yeah, absolutely. So we're a group of uh, nurseries as part of the Plant Fairs Roadshow, and without them kind of supporting me in the build-up and on the days preparing, it would have been a lot harder work. Well, I mean, it looks absolutely beautiful. I have to say, you know, you divided the exhibit in two halves. Um, you've got your woven willow through the middle. You know, it's really high standard. Now you've got a silver. Yep. Are you happy with that? A silver pleased. at Chelsea yeah. is very good. I'm really pleased. I'm a novice at doing this kind of thing, so I'm really thrilled. And actually, you know, the feedback you get from the public is probably more important in any case. I'm getting lots of love for it, so it's really great. Well, congratulations. Thank you very much. So, Steve and Lou, this is your first time at Chelsea as the No Name Nursery. So, how are people responding to the Plant Show Roadshow as a whole and particularly to your stand? Well, I think they're loving our stand because it's so unusual. <laughs> uh, and I think certainly uh, the concept of uh, a collective of nurseries that hold plant fairs at venues around the southeast. I think it's going down really well with people that have not heard of us before. You know, we grow really unusual and interesting plants, we think. Obviously, you've got a silver gill, and, yeah. and, and are you yeah. pleased? Yeah, of course. I, I, I mean, I you think, must be. Yeah, I think you should be. It's absolutely wonderful. So what question are you most being asked by the visitors? What's the name of the giraffe? No. <laughs> <laughs> and what is the name of the giraffe? It, it doesn't, doesn't have, have a name. name. It doesn't have a name. So it's no name giraffe then. <laughs> Excellent.
this year's Chelsea has an interesting mixture of traditional skills, crafts and materials, and also combining them, using those techniques with modern materials and for modern purposes to create something new. Here on Horatio's garden, there are a number of examples of this. The pod at the back, the building, is clad in wooden weatherboarding tiles made out of uh, redwood grown in Devon. All handmade, all attached individually, but very, very effective, very weather resistant. There are three stone cans, beautifully crafted by traditional stonemasons using centuries old technique, but they act both as modern sculptural objects within the garden and also as a symbol of a pathway ahead. The path made out of terrazzo, using waste stone, very often marble, they traditionally bound with cement to create this hard surface, but this is now using a cement-free mixture, which is porous. So for a wheelchair user, there are no wet slicks, and you have a beautifully smooth, even, and this is really important if you're on a wheelchair surface. And finally, a water feature, in, in a completely modern way, using iron, using metal. And finally, the garden bench, which is made out of yew, is completely bespoke, very modern, but of course the techniques needed to make it and the principle of making something beautiful for a garden are based upon very traditional crafts. This building is on the garden called A Letter from a Million Years Past by He He Huang. It represents a Korean herb drying tower with the herbs hanging on beams collected from the mountainside. But the skills in making it are very British. It's done by British craftsmen using techniques to repair buildings that might be medieval and have sustained. And what I love about it is, is that it's infinitely adaptable and repairable. So there are soft materials, lime plaster, wattle and daub. Notice that the wattle part is actually spit bamboo, which is of course a nod to the Korean heritage. And that means that it will get wet, there will be holes, but they can all be repaired. So the building, using these techniques, can endure all weathers, all years, maybe not a million years, but certainly hundreds. Now it's not just hard landscaping that's being adapted and sometimes modernised here at Chelsea. There are some classic plants that were once heralded as superstars but have fallen out of fashion that are now being revived for a new generation. Here's Carol with her guide to the plants. She thinks we all need to learn to love again. Every so often things that we've deemed our absolute favourites fall below the popularity line. And I want to make sure some of those plants get a true revival. Fuchsias, I suppose, are a typical example. I love fuchsias because not only are they easy to grow, but also they must be one of the most simple things to propagate. Ordinarily, you'd always take your cuttings directly below a leaf node. You can with fuchsias, but you can also take them internodally. So anywhere up this stem, snip it off, put it around the edge of a pot of gritty compost, water it well once, and put it in a warm, bright place out of direct sunlight. Just look at the variety of different fuchsias here. Everybody can choose their own special favorite. The important thing is to have a fuchsia in your garden. Begonias. We're all used to those ones with little dainty flowers, but what about these great big buxom beauties? <laughs> Aren't they utterly gorgeous? This one's called party dress, and this one, can can, and that's exactly how they make you feel, positively festive. So if you want to join in the big begonia revival, what you're going to start off with is something like this. This is a begonia tuber. There are the little shoots coming through, and this is where the roots emerge. Just put it into a pot of peat-free compost, smallish pot, and get it started. March is a good time to plant it. Water at first very gingerly, and then gradually it will begin to grow. These will flower right the way through the summer. When the first frost comes, take it indoors at that point, then store it for the winter, 
embark or dry compost and then next March start all over again. Well, these begonias we grow for their gorgeous flowers, but there are others which are famed for their foliage. Who would have thought that leaves could be so luscious? Just look at the drama in these beautiful leaves of this begonia rex. If you want to make more of these lovely plants, it's such good fun. You simply take a mature leaf, make sure it's full grown but not shriveled at all, get a little tray of compost, cut your leaf up into squares, probably sort of inch squares, I don't do centimeters, <laughs> and then weight each one down maybe with a little pebble. Having watered it well, leave it alone. Eventually, every one of the leaf veins which is in contact with the compost will make a small new plantlet and eventually the big leaf will shrivel and you can detach those plantlets, making a brand new clone of exactly the same plant. They're simple, straightforward plants to grow and so very, very rewarding. And now you know how to make more. So Monty, are there any plants that you think we should shout about a little bit more? Well, it's a difficult one, that, because, um, I mean, I use wild strawberries a lot as, as ground cover under hedges and things. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a fabulous plant. At this time of year, I just adore uh, foxgloves. Well, I, I guess we do shout about them, <laughs> but they well, are fantastic. Mexican fleabane, you know, their little erigerum. Yes. We don't shout that flowers all summer long yeah, yeah. and it seeds itself around. I absolutely love it. We don't shout about that enough. No, OK, so well, I just we'll give that. You, you've given it a shout. Uh, and here's what else we've got in store for you on tonight's coverage of the RHS Chelsea Flower Show 2023, an event supported by the Newton. Actress Caroline Quinton gives us a tour of her own wonderful garden in Devon before I meet her to talk about the inspiration that she's taking away from Chelsea this year. And I'll be demonstrating how to create habitats in your garden that not only provides a home for wildlife, but adds to the beauty of your space too. And Francis is explaining how our scorching summers are changing the fruit that we can grow at home and how we can help our gardens to adapt. First, Adam has more inspiration for your gardens at home. He's taking a look behind the beauty to explain how you can still have a captivating garden whilst making design choices that suit our changing environment. This week I've been looking how designers use materials and plants to create these beautiful spaces. Whilst being mindful, of their environmental impact. Tonight, I'm gonna to focus on wildlife and how the designers have come up with some fantastic ideas, how we can improve the ecosystems in our gardens and maybe even future-proof them. This is a fantastic way to view a garden. You get a real understanding of the space. And this is 12 metres by 10 metres, so probably an average size of a new build house. It starts with the tree, the cornice mass, that comes down then onto the herbaceous planting. And then there's water that runs all the way through. And you think about wildlife, they want to feel safe, they want food, they need water. That works really well. Martin, the designer, has used all UK source timber to create this, well, rather charming building. This is all large. It silvers down, doesn't need any treatment, and looks great. But the bit I really love is it doubles as a bird hide. You don't need anything this grand. You imagine this could just be a screen in the garden with a little slot through it. Put a chair behind, a little feeder over there. Job done. You can enjoy the birds. Those bird boxes behind me, they are that reminder. It's, it's worth doing a little bit of research. What are the birds that come into your garden? How do they want to live? And then you provide for them. Sparrows are in groups. 
So that is a posh Chelsea Terrace, you know? But again, the cracks, the crevices over time, even a wall in your garden will take on a life of its own. Somewhere to put your prunings. It's great, isn't it? Tidy up the garden, put your sticks in, build a habitat. But the great bit, little hedge up hole at the bottom there. Hedgehogs can go in, make a home. These are dotted around the garden. As you sit here, you can feel yourself calming and this planting, the wildlife's in there, it's busy doing its thing. And this shows that we don't have to lose that beauty to live in harmony with the natural world. Well, as Adam mentioned, our gardens are not only vital spaces for us to escape, but a home for wildlife to thrive in. And we can and should be incorporating habitats into our gardens, designs to create a cohesive space. And no garden at Chelsea this year demonstrates the importance of a strong relationship between people and wildlife better than this one. I'm here on the Royal Entomological Society garden designed by Tom Massey. And there's so many ideas here that we can incorporate into our own spaces. You can go the whole hog, like he has here, or just pick and choose a few little bits and pieces. Don't be over tidy for a start. At the back, we've got this wonderful gabion wall, which is holding up a significant amount of soil. Now, gabions are just wire baskets, and they're brilliant when you're terracing a slope and you put the wire basket in and you can fill it with anything you want, you know, rocks or stones or timber or terracotta, terracotta pots like he has here. And they're creating the important nooks and crannies for insects, for their habitat, for them to overwinter in. We've got decaying wood in various forms. Here it's just lying on the bank, and over there it's a lovely sculptural piece in the garden. And this is a permeable surface. Now this means that water can drain through, which is important rather than going down the drain and in increasing flash flooding and stuff like that. But it also means that burrowing insects and animals can get down through into the soil beneath. Really simple ideas that we can all think about. Over here we've got water, and water is a magnet for wildlife. If you can incorporate it, even just a little puddle in your garden, it will bring a whole range, as well as birds, to drink from. You'll have little pond skaters and maybe newts and toads and everything, and you're creating this whole habitat that is all interlinked and working together. So foliage is important, not just living foliage on the plants, but when the leaves drop onto the ground and start decaying, again, it gives nice cover for insects, so don't be overly tidy. This is a great example. Just let it go a little bit and think about everything you put in and how it's all working for wildlife. And this is certainly working because throughout the week, you know, that's a huge lab you see behind you, that main structure, which is brilliant, I think. And there have been 75 10-minute surveys taken throughout the week on this garden. And there's been 211 visits from all different insects. Don't know where they're going to go at the end of the show, but they might come to your garden if you create the right habitat for them. For the first time in over a decade, the RHS has a new Director General in charge. Claire Madison has already made her mark by holding a picnic for a hundred children <laughs> for the first time in the show's history and uh, is championing getting more young people into garden. And I'm thrilled that Claire is with me now. Claire, so is the fact of, of getting young people into gardening the single most important thing at the moment or is that just one of the many plans you have? It, involving more young people, you know, so, so I think getting young people children and I you know and their faces they were so excited when they were here to Chelsea um, just to give them a little bit of excitement and, and then sending them back with seeds and things that they could then take back to their school and share uh, you know it's the start of saying let's start young with gardening with children yeah. and I think just getting that message out because there's the world. no question about it that like it or not um, gardening the RHS uh, in general has a slightly middle-aged sort of 
reference point, doesn't it? Yeah. So what we're looking at is how do we make sure whether, you know, right from sort of birth, curious child, sort of inquiring adolescent, all the way through to kind of that sort of late accomplishment, that how do we make sure that there's something for everybody? Do you is. think that this year's show is reflecting that? I hope so. I hope it's sort of there's something for everybody here. We've noticed that there's a lot of charities involved in, in, in the big show gardens. Now. Yeah, is I, that going to continue? I think it's a really interesting point. There's, you know, I think it's wonderful that Chelsea can highlight those charities. Um, but what Chelsea is about, it sort of reflects what's going on in society today. It sort of comes to us, we open it out. So next year might be a whole different set of charities talking about different messages, different things. So, yeah, that's what I love about Chelsea. It's a big reflection of, of how we're feeling about the world. People are loving it. I mean, the feedback that we're getting is very positive. Are you getting good feedback? I'm getting fabulous. It's my first Chelsea, yeah. so it's a little bit terrifying, if I yeah. dare say it. Um, but we're coming to the end of the week, and it's been fabulous. And I am getting so many people, whether they're watching it on the television, or you know, people who are coming and are talking to people here. Also, our exhibitors, our designers. You know, so much work goes on behind the scenes to make this what I think is the best show for horticulture in the world. What about the other shows that are coming, that are following through? You've got Hampton, you've got Tatton. Uh, what plans have you for those? So we've got so Hampton and Tatton will happen this year. Very different kind of shows. You know, Hampton, it, it's, you know, it's it's beautiful Hampton Court garden. So you you know you just have that extraordinary history heritage around yeah. you. So I think it's, it, it feels very different and it feels very personal. Uh, Tatton will happen next year. We're very excited. We're going to have our first ever urban show. So look out for that, and that will feel very different. And coming back to that garden adventure once again, and that will be perhaps some young professionals who are thinking about indoor house plants, containers who don't necessarily have gardens. So uh, yeah, something I hope a little bit different, a little bit exciting from the RHS. I will look forward to that. Yeah. Due to our changing climate, we're having to adapt the way we garden as our seasons become more challenging. Chelsea's helping lead the way on new approaches to handle this unpredictable weather. Francis is examining the impact our scorching summers have on the fruit that we grow. In recent years, our climate has been getting warmer and it might mean we have to rethink some of the fruits that we grow in our gardens. Take the humble apple, for example. Now, classic British varieties like Cox's Orange Pippin are becoming less productive as our winters get warmer. Generally speaking, apples need about a thousand hours per winter of cold. That's fertilisation, it means between about six degrees and freezing. That helps them to produce more fruits for the following year. For example, although there is an interest growing in heritage cultivars that might be local to your area, like this. This is Sir John Thornycroft, and it's a heritage apple from about 1913. It may not grow quite as well in the same places as it was bred. So an apple that was bred in the south of England, for instance, might now perform better up north. And in the south of England, you might want to look at French cultivars, or even further afield ones like Fiji from Japan, or Gala from New Zealand. So what makes a fruit a fruit? Well, botanically speaking, it's the part of a plant that contains the seeds. And the reason why they're so delicious is because the idea is that animals like us will eat them and then disperse those seeds far and wide as they pass through our systems. That means that the seedlings don't always grow around the base of the parent plant where they'll outcompete them, but they grow up much further afield. That means the genes spread further and the parent plant survives. But making fruits for a plant requires lots of energy, and that means nutrients. And most plants take up their nutrients through the watering. So hot, dry summers, we need to really up our game with watering. And tomatoes are a prime example. So watering really well and watering more regularly will prevent things like blossom end rot, which is a deficiency that causes the end of the fruit to turn black and taste much less good. One of the plants that seems to be very resistant to the unpredictable weather that we're having is this, the elderberry. Now it can cope on most soil types and most habitats and it even seems to do quite well in the very hot and very dry years that we're having. This year though, the flowers are about three weeks later than they were in the very hot spring of 2020. 
and the flowers are followed by fruit from about August through September and October potentially. These berries are also extremely good for us. They're really high in iron, phosphorus, vitamins A, B6 and C. But you do have to cook them before you eat them because some varieties have a level of toxicity if you eat the berries raw. We know from records that people have been eating elderberries since the Stone Age. And if it was good enough for people then, and it's good enough for us now, hopefully it's a crop that we'll be able to rely on whatever the weather throws at us. Now, in a minute or two, I'm going to be joined by the actress of stage and screen, Caroline Quinton, who's a self-professed, passionate gardener and a familiar face here at Chelsea. But before I meet her, let's take a look at her own large garden that she's created at her home in Devon. My garden is my solace. I use it as a sort of respite, really, from the world. I'm Caroline Quentin. I'm an actor, a presenter, a writer, and a passionate amateur gardener. I'm delighted to welcome you to my garden, otherwise known as CQ Gardens Headquarters. This is my home in Devon. We're not far from the market town of Tiverton. We've been here for about 20 years and when we arrived there was a derelict house and there was no garden. The first thing I was keen to do was to put in this large pond. I planted the trees around the same time. When you look at them now, they look like they've been here for hundreds of years, but they haven't actually. They've been here about 15 years, probably most of them. If you listen, Stop purring, no one can hear the birds. <laughs> here I've got some Mitsuna. Don't know if you know your salad leaves, that's a really sharp, hot one. Further along here, there are radishes growing. They are tiny at the moment. Look how small they are. Oh, look, up, 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 oh my God. That has never happened before. I've never seen that, that was extraordinary. That was really right over my head, it was huge. Um, yes, as I said, it's so quiet here in the countryside. Hardly any noise. Here comes the tractor. I planted these in November. This is my garlic. And here are my globe artichokes. These were given to me by my postman, Paul. And I have to be a bit careful because he's had no luck with his. And I have huge success with mine. So don't tell him or he won't deliver any of my post. Look at that. Look at that, Paul. <laughs> I've just put my peas in here because I saw Monty putting his peas in. He was using hazel, I couldn't find any hazel, so I've used willow here. But underneath here are the most delicious little peas and I can't wait to get them out of their pods. Welcome to my greenhouse. This is my favorite place on earth. It's the scene of some great triumphs and some rather pathetic disasters. As you can see I've got courgettes, tomatoes, cucumbers, sunflowers, but you will also spot that there are a few pots with not much in them and that's because I've had some failures in here too, but I think that is the sign of being a true gardener when you fail and then the following year you try again. Who's meant to be in there? I'll tell you who's meant to be in there. A fabulous cucumber is meant to be in there, but he never showed up. Fortuitously, some of his other friends have, so I'll be all right. Welcome to my potting shed. This is what I call my make, do and mend space. It's made up of lots of old bits of things, furniture and stuff that basically has outlived its usefulness in the house, but I use it all here. That thing there, is from an old factory, but um, it's found a new home here with me and I plant it up with geraniums in the height of summer and it's delightful. I like to reuse everything. This door was once the larder door in the house, but I took it away and now I use it here for my potting shed and you can see the memories of my children growing up here. This was William and then following them all up, there's my daughter there. Look at these memories here. I love that. Weeds. And I've always thought weeds are good. I'm way ahead. 
in this regard. I have been cultivating weeds for years in this garden because I don't own... Be here now. Carolyn, hello. hello. Lovely to have you here. Lovely your to garden here. looks fantastic. Thank you very much. I'm deeply envious of your pond. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? I know. We it's... put it in. It was the first thing we ever did yeah. because I'd always heard, and it's quite right, that if you put a body of water into the land, nature and wildlife will yeah. follow and boy oh boy that yeah. is just true and i always say to people it doesn't matter if it's a saucer full of water or a big pond put water in and everything will find yeah. you yeah you make it and they will come Correct. absolutely so you've come here to chelsea i know you've had a good look around um what's what's grabbed your imagination as much as anything else I think this year, because I mean, I, I've, I've been coming over the years, and I think this year what's really interesting is the sort of narrative that the stories are uh, the gardens are telling, the stories they are kind of introducing us to, and about how I think we are starting to use our gardens in lots of different ways. So there is the kind of homegrown narrative, there is the, the, the place for, for peace and respite narrative, there is the um, the global warming narrative and and i've 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 sort of loved there's um there's a, a garden here which is um dealing with uh, grief mm. and i thought that was a fascinating look actually about how our our, our our garden spaces which are created in in um whether it be cemeteries or crematoriums mm. should be softer more beautiful places where you can sit by water and also if you want to go and cry mm. have a private place to mm. do that and not an open manicured lawn so mm. I, I really enjoyed that notion I mean, it's quite a big leap isn't it from from a garden like yours or mine or, or a back garden to set a, a sort of crematorium or a cemetery yeah. or whatever yeah um, do you find that th these show gardens and Chelsea in general is achieving that or do, or do you think that maybe this is quite hard it's quite tricky to take on ideas like that I think it is. I think it's difficult, and yeah. I think I think to get it right. I mean, the garden we're sitting in now yeah. is just a brilliant example of how to make Chelsea a real thing. Yeah. So you walk into this garden, and I know there are hundreds of people around, so yeah. I can hear them, and I can hear the parakeets. I know exactly yeah. where I am in the world, and yet. I look around me and I understand this space. Mm. I recognise things, even though it is much more beautiful than anything I could ever create. I can, I can imagine myself spending a beautiful time amongst these irises, these poppies, mm. and, and all these um, the sedums. I just, I think, that just it's some, when it's right in Chelsea, it's really good. Yeah. I mean, you're a very experienced gardener. You're modest about it, but you're experienced and you're good. What do, you, what do you take back from Chelsea? Is there always something new or is it a slow... What are you going to take back home this time? Um, I think this year, for me, I'm going to um, have more confidence in my own choices. Mm. I notice there are a lot of um, weeds in, in, in being mm. used in, in kind of quite you know in ways that they've always been eradicated we've eradicated weeds and i have never eradicated weeds in my garden i like to think i was a very early adopter a very early trendsetter yeah. when it came came yeah. to weeding i mean listen i will i'll jump on my asparagus bed and i'll weed that because i need that to be weed yeah. free to, for the asparagus yeah. to produce but other places i can turn a blind eye and i can and i can convince myself that it's better that way because the moths will come you will allow the weeds into your garden I will allow uh, well them. listen Go home, relish your weeds, <laughs> <laughs> embrace them you in did. the spirit of Chelsea. And thank you very much for talking to Thank you so much for Absolutely. inviting me. Now, one of the most important plants we should be investing in right now are trees. They might feel daunting, as there's a lot of considerations to make when buying one, but they are vital to have because they benefit ourselves, wildlife and the environment. And I'm here on the Burnkoos Nursery exhibit and it's got a huge range of trees and you can see all the details of the foliage and they'll give you lots of really good advice about the eventual size of it and where it will grow. And I know when buying a tree, 
You know, you can end up with this choice paralysis. There's so many out there and, oh, I don't want to plant it too near the house because it's going to get into the foundations. But I urge you to have at least one tree in your garden, however small the garden is, or even if it's in a balcony, you can grow trees in containers as long as you water them enough. And there's some great trees here. I mean, this one here, Hippophae rhamnoides, this is a sea buckthorn. It's a beautiful silvery leaf tree. You get fruit later in the year, bright orange fruit standing out against the foliage. And this is great for sea conditions, coastal conditions, which also means it does well in roof terraces and balconies. It can cope with really harsh winds and it's not going to get too big. And if it does, you can just prune it back a little bit. At the back there, we've got Roost Typhina. That one's called Tiger Eye. I remember Roost Typhina, the, the staghorn sumac in the 70s and 80s, really fashionable, went out of fashion. Well, they're back again because they're a great tree. That's a multi-stemmed form, which means you get lots of volume. It's sculptural, quite majestic, and it takes up more space. So it's great for wildlife. The birds will come and perch in there. In the autumn, the foliage is the most intense burning red. It's a brilliant tree. We've got a ginkgo here, pretty much bomb proof. Again, great autumn color. And all of these trees come in different sizes. So talk to the nurserymen. You can buy them bare rooted, you can buy them root balled or in containers. And the best time to plant them is, is in the autumn or the spring. Um, and you can get some really good deals and think that you're investing for the future. Um, there's also one here that I'd like to point out, which is the eucalyptus over there. Eucalyptus, you know, massive, get enormous. Well, again, there's varieties that are more garden worthy. This is the eucalyptus, um, the dwarf snow gum. It'll only get to about five or six meters and you can prune it back as well. And you get that lovely juvenile growth that florists adore. So don't get freaked out about trees. Make sure you get at least one in your garden. There are lots of lovely things here, but there is one plant that I'd like to take home with me, and it's this. This looks like a stone pine, but in fact it's a Scots pine that has been brilliantly trained and pruned, it's a piece of topiary really, to look like a stone pine with its umbrella top. And the beauty of being a Scots pine is that as long as the soil is slightly acidic, It'll grow in any weathers. It's about as hardy a plant as you possibly could grow in the British Arts. And I think this would look pretty good along with it. So when the show's over, I might take this home with me. Now, having bagged myself a tree, I think that I'd like a water feature, and there is no better water feature here at Chelsea than this one by Mr Ishihara on his biophilic garden. And what I love about this, apart from the beauty, is the ambition of it. It shows that for most of us, when we make a water feature, just the fact we've done it is a bit of an achievement in itself. But look what you can do. This was just a field, a bit of grass a few weeks ago. But with ingenuity, very simple pumps, some lovely rocks, you create a whole world of a mountainside and a little bit of water and a few square yards. And I could do with that back at home. Now, I'm ending up with something that is slightly elusive, because here on the National Brain Appeals Rare Space Garden, designed by Charlie Hawks, I'm choosing a planting design or concept. Now, it's based upon a form of Alzheimer's where the brain scrambles the messages that your eyes are giving you. And that causes all kinds of problems. What Charlie's done is use the planting to simplify and codify the way the brain takes images. So you have this lovely understory of these interlocking patterns and shifts of green plants. And then dots and highlights and intervals of colour and fragrance. And the colour sometimes is very strong. So, for example, on the seats, it's bright blue, it's recognisable as a place of safety. And you can sit and you know that it's a seat and the brain will take that. And although in terms of the Alzheimer's that's very moving, in terms of my own garden at home, actually I've learned something. You don't have to have lots of different colours working through. You can just use a little bit of colour here and there. And that's really powerful. So I think that's a message that I will try and apply to home.
Well, what a great week it's been. And I think my main takeaway is, well, mainly from Cleves Garden, is, you know, a weed is only a weed if it's invasive or it becomes a problem. And actually there are you know, areas of a garden where you can just encourage these wildflowers and you know, nettles and what we would call weeds. You know, they're great for the environment. Just, just let them go. And I'm just letting myself go a I little just, bit. I love this new Joe, this yeah. loose, free person. Good. Go on. Okay, right, here we go. go. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Jane Lonsdale asks, when is the best time to divide a large clump of camassia? Well, there are two times, really. Uh, obviously, you could do it in autumn. You could do it in September, October. But you can't see them by then. No. And we do all our dividing of, of camassias now. Um, early June, camassias are slow to die back. But when they do die back, you can't see the damage. Yeah, but you've got the foliage. Yes. Just dig them up. Dig them up, divide them, replant them, and they should be fine. And by the way, uh, camassias do really well in grass. So, yeah. th you know, give yeah, that they a like go. a bit of moisture. Yeah. Um, and they do well in your garden. They do, course. they love my garden. But also, if you want to divide them in the autumn, mark them with a stick. Yes. Because then you know where they are. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to lose them. Yeah. Rachel Southwell asks I'm trying to turn an area of lawn into wildflower meadow. I scarified the area, over sowed with a wildflower mix two years ago. Year one, I had a lovely mix of flowers, but this year, all I have is lots of yellow rattle. Mm. What do I do next? It doesn't sound like a bad situation to me. Yellow rattle is fundamental. She's got lots of yellow rattle. That's brilliant. And that's going to weaken the grass. It will weaken the grass. It's semi-parasitic on grass. Also, I suspect there are lots of other things that are very small at the moment and not really revealing themselves. Uh, and I think what you can do is don't do anything radical. Enjoy the yellow rattle and anything else that comes. Cut it really short in yeah. sort of July, August. Yeah. Scarify it again so the seed can have contact with the soil. And be patient. It takes years to get it. Yeah, yeah you've got to be patient. Yeah. Rebecca Lee Highland asks, uh, Monty and Joe, my peonies won't flower. Is it my clay soil, perhaps? Probably, actually, Rebecca. It's because they're planted too deep. Too deep. Often they're yeah. planted too yeah. deep. So you, you need to lift them up the clump. Yeah. I mean, ideally in the autumn, yeah. get the crown up a little bit. And people often mulch over them That's as right. well. So they end up deeper yeah. and deeper yeah. and deeper. That's so exactly right. They don't flower. Another quickie. Come oh, on. Another quickie. Wendy, when tulips finished, uh, do I cut the leaves and stem back or let them die? No, no, don't cut them back. Don't ever cut bulbs back. Leave the stem. You can snap off the seed head, leave the stem, leave the leaves, let them die right back. Because those leaves are giving the energy, putting yes. the energy back into yes. the bulb to flower yeah. next year. Yeah. Yeah. OK, there we go. Well, that's it for today. We will be back tomorrow evening on BBC Two at 10 past eight to look back at what has been a superb week here at the Chelsea Flower Show 2023. So until tomorrow, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Position, Nikki. Can always stay at Ozzy to get a start.